Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Hutton Ethics Lectureship. My name is Holly Banty, and I'm an Associate Vice President in the Office of Research and Research Security and Ethics. We are very excited to have Dr. Mildred Cho join us today for our virtual event. While we were hoping to welcome her to Cincinnati, the severe weather in the West has changed our ability to do that um, as it's washed out roads and made travel treacherous and her journey to the airport impossible. She's actually on her 10th day without power. So she is joining us today um, by uh, generator. So we are very excited to have her here. And thank you everyone for understanding as we pivoted to a virtual event for today's lecture. So now for some housekeeping, just some general reminders, please. Make sure that your name is correctly displayed in Zoom so that we know who you are. Uh, this is important for attendance um, as well as those requesting CME. You just need to hover over and click the three dots um, in your Zoom box to edit your name. Uh, the chat feature will be used for questions of our presenter today. Please send your questions to myself or to Rick Ittenbach, um, who I'll introduce in a second. And I'll put a reminder in the chat room for this. Um, we don't wanna distract um, Dr. Cho as she's speaking. So if you can send your questions, privately to Rick or myself, that would be much appreciated. Um, you can also just raise your hand to be called on afterward for questions um, and answer um, discussion. For those requesting CME credit uh, for today's event, you'll need to return an evaluation form to me via email following today's lecture. Um, if you do not return the evaluation form, you will not receive credit. So I will, at the end of today's um, lecture, probably sometime tomorrow, um, I will be sending all attendees at the conclusion of the event an email with the evaluation form. Those requesting CME, please make sure to return it. Um, and obviously I'm requesting everyone um, to complete the evaluation and, and to return it. Uh, without further delay, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Ittenbach, Professor in Pediatrics and Associate Director for Planning and Evaluation in the Division of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Rick will honor the Hutton family um, who makes this and other lectureships in the College of Medicine possible, and he will also introduce our speaker, Dr. Mildred Cho. Okay, Rick, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Holly. <laughs> In 2004, the Hutton family, in collaboration with the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, asked Dr. John Hutton what they could do to commemorate his many years of service to the college, first as Dean of the College of Medicine, and later as Chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics. As a lifelong proponent of medical education and an unwavering commitment to instilling strong leadership, values, and patient-centered care in the students, faculty, and staff, the College of Medicine proposed creating an endowed chair of ethics in his name. While he was very much honored by the request, he asked instead about the possibility of creating an endowed lectureship offered each year to bring in thought leaders from around the world to specifically, world specifically to challenge our ideas and stimulate meaningful discussions about many of today's most pressing problems in medicine. The goal of this lectureship is to not only introduce our community to thought leaders from around the world, but to challenge our thinking and keep the flow of ideas fresh, thought provoking, and in the best interests of those we serve, our patients, young and old alike. This year, as in years past, the Hutton Lectureship serves as one of the keynote presentations of the University of Cincinnati's Research and Innovation Week. This year's speaker is Dr. Mildred Cho from Stanford University. Dr. Cho is a professor in the Division of Medical Genetics, Department of Pediatrics, and in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health, Department of Medicine at Stanford. She's also Associate Director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, where she directs the Center for Integration of Research on Genetics and Ethics, and co-directs the Center for Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research Resources and Analysis. Of particular importance is that she is now the co-director of the NHGRI funded center for LC resources and analysis, and that the resources that they provide on ethics of genomic and data science are publicly available to anyone at lchub.org. 
She reserved her she received her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from MIT and her Doctorate of Philosophy in Pharmacology from Stanford. <clears throat> Dr. Cho's major areas of interest include the ethical and social impacts of genetic research and data science, along with their applications to precision medicine, gene therapy, the human microbiome, and synthetic biology. Her current work examines how values and ethics can be integrated into the design of artificial intelligence in health applications. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce to you this year's Hutton Lectureship speaker, Dr. Mildred Cho, and her talk entitled, Moral Engagement, Disengagement, and Conflicts in Development of Healthcare AI. Mildred. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for uh, the invitation to speak in the Hutton Ethics Lectureship, and I hope that the work I'm going to present today uh, are in the spirit of the Hutton Lectureship. Uh, I want to acknowledge support for the work that I'll present from the Greenwald Foundation and from the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, for those of you who are joining in and participants in a CME course, I'm showing the objectives here, for, but for the rest of you, they serve as a sort of outline of what I'll talk about today, which is potential harms from the application of AI-based tools in healthcare settings, um, as identified by those who develop those tools, and factors that potentially exacerbate those harms, particularly in the healthcare context. Um, so I'll be talking about findings from my research on AI developers' views of their responsibility to mitigate potential harms that could be relevant to safety, effectiveness, and regulation of AI in healthcare. So again, for CME purposes, I'll disclose uh, relationships with commercial interests held by me and members of the planning committee. Um, in this slide here, you can see that we're sort of a boring group with nothing to disclose. Okay, there. Um, and finally, the opinions expressed here are mine and not those of the University of Cincinnati or any other university. So let's launch into the, um, the subject of the talk today, which is machine learning based predictive analytics in healthcare. As many of you may know, machine learning based systems are increasingly used to make significant decisions about patient care. Although there's a lot of activity to bring AI to diagnostics, um, especially in radiology and pathology and for clinical decision support, much of the AI actually in use in healthcare systems at this time are machine learning based predictive analytics to increase efficiency of healthcare. However, we're also discovering that poorly designed or biased machine learning models can threaten patient safety and equity. So there's a now famous paper published in Science a couple of years ago that illustrated racial bias in a widely used commercial predictive model used to identify patients with complex healthcare needs. The authors traced the bias in the model to the use of healthcare costs as a proxy for healthcare needs. Since black patients in the population used to train the model were considerably sicker than white patients with the same risk score, the model significantly underestimated the need of health of the black patients. The authors also found that when the source of bias was removed, the percentage of black patients who would be recommended to receive additional care by this model would increase from 17.7% to 46.5%. So that example showed how the choice of variables, thus a design choice in modeling can introduce bias. Another example that's been identified is the use of area under the curve as a performance metric because it treats false positives and false negatives as equally important. Um, whereas in most clinical situations that you can think of, um, physicians and patients probably do not treat false positives and false negatives equally. So think about the importance of missing a malignant tumor versus falsely identifying one. So therefore, values are embedded in choices in AI design, including how AI performance is evaluated. So another way of saying that is that a source of AI bias is human bias. 
in other types of biomedical research, we build in bias control measures, such as randomization and masking in clinical trials, with the assumption that bias exists and needs to be mitigated. So these practices, which are essentially practices of self-questioning and self-regulation, are now part of clinical research culture and are accompanied by external oversight that is part of a well-developed regulatory environment to evaluate safety and efficacy of medical products. However, much of AI and healthcare does not undergo such systematic evaluation or oversight. That's because performance of AI-based tools is challenging to evaluate, in part because AI and machine learning in particular are not very transparent, but also because evaluation processes and benchmarks have not been well established. An example of how these challenges become problematic was seen in the sepsis prediction model developed by EPIC. One of the purposes of predicting sepsis is, direct, is to direct care, such as antibiotic prescription to patients more quickly. However, one of the variables used by EPIC's sepsis prediction algorithm was whether a doctor had already ordered antibiotic. So in a sense, the model was cheating. This highlights the need for standardization of models of uh, uh, machine learning model, uh, methods of machine learning model performance and best practices for model development specific to the healthcare context. Furthermore, independent evaluations of the septus model in different healthcare systems yielded highly variable performance characteristics. In one study, it failed to identify 67% of patients with sepsis. However, we generally don't know how the model performs in the health systems that are using it because most have not published evaluations of it in their patient populations. So recognizing that software requires a different strategy for evaluation and oversight than drugs or de traditional devices, the FDA has been testing a voluntary pathway as part of a process-based regulatory approach that focuses on software developers demonstrating, quote, a culture of quality and organizational excellence. So those are the FDA's words. This approach thus shifts the locus of responsibility for assessing and mitigating harms to software developers. However, I think we've seen that in the world of software development and AI in particular, it's currently a wild west built on a culture that is accustomed to thinking of end users as evaluators, thus shifting the locus of responsibility for safety and efficacy away from the developers. The lack of regulation and technology and difficulty of, eval of evaluating AI-based tools means that the tools are essentially being beta tested on patients in real clinical situations and without systematic data gathering on adverse effects with the possibility of serious harm. The culture of software engineering and computer science is unlike medicine, which is based on fiduciary duties that are placed ahead of self-interests. There's some tradition of this type of professionalism in engineering, which uses certification and licensure as a means of assuring, assuring competency and public safety. But licensure of software engineers is still not required in the US and remains a point of contention among practitioners. Furthermore, requirements of licenses for software engineering focus on demonstrating competency and training rather than understanding of ethics, duties, responsibility, or regulation, and how those factors should be considered during the design process. And note that engineers consider their duties to be to, to their clients, whereas clinicians have duties to patients. And so clients and patients are not necessarily the same thing. So given this environment of AI development for healthcare, this leads to the question, how do we assure the safety and efficacy of machine learning in medicine? And what are the potential barriers to ethical machine learning? So I'll present some of the results of a study that I conducted that was funded by the Greenwell Foundation to address these questions. And I wanna acknowledge my co-principal investigator on this project, Pamela Sankar at the University of Pennsylvania and my students and colleagues at Stanford. So the aims of this study were to find out first what machine learning, what machine learning based predictive analytics were actually being used at, at the time in the US, um, which was in 2019 uh, and 2020. 
as distinguished from diagnostic. So that's important to remember. And second, to understand how developers thought about the potential harms of their work and their role in mitigating those harms. So I'll focus on the second of these two aims, but briefly first summarize the types of predictive analytics that we found. So from anal analyzing literature and news databases, we identified 106 machine learning based predictive analytic products that analyze health records data and that appear to be in use in US healthcare settings in 2019. And we found that they clustered into five types of uses to predict disease onset and progression, treatment outcomes, cost and utilization of healthcare, decompensation and adverse events, such as the sepsis alert system that I mentioned just now, patient admissions and readmissions. I'll just give you a couple of examples of some of these um, uh, products. So the first example is the Waystar platform, which uses social determinants of health combined with hospital and consumer data to stratify patient populations according to risk and cost. It also helps with revenue integrity by identifying incorrectly coded and undercoded claims to help providers maximize revenue. These descriptions that I'm giving you here are based on language the companies used in their marketing materials. And Waystar is a medium-sized private information technology company, which is fairly typical of, of the companies that we found. Uh, another example is the Midas readmission penalty forecaster developed by Conduit in response uh, partly to the CMS hospital readmissions reduction programs. It's meant to help healthcare organizations predict penalties for 30-day unplanned readmissions and to adjust care delivery. This product estimates total readmissions, excess readmissions, and financial pen penalties for patients diagnosed with acute MI, heart failure, pneumonia, ED, and other conditions. Conduent is a large information technology. It works in healthcare, but also in 20 other industries, um, ranging from insurance, and government to casinos, oil, and gas. So we then interviewed 40 data scientists, uh, as well as software engineers, managers, and executives recruited from 15 of these 106 organizations that represented a range of types and size uh, of companies. Most of the interviewees worked directly with data, but many also had other roles, including high-level management roles. About a third of uh, these interviewees had health-related advanced degrees. In our interviews, we asked participants about their background in training, the goals of their organization and products, facilitators and barriers to product development, potential benefits and harms, and their views on regulation and oversight. So I'll focus today on their statements about harms. So we were somewhat surprised to find that our interviewers named quite a large range of potential harms, which we categorized as harms to individuals, groups, and to the healthcare system. And I'll show you examples of quotes uh, where they discussed or described each of these three types of uh, harms. So one type was uh, harms to individuals from their products, and this is what one subtype, which we called misdirection of care, that is harms that could result to patients if AI models wrongly predicted whether a patient would need care. So in this first quote, you can see uh, that they say, it's hard to realize that somebody could get treatment um, for a claim uh, or a claim for somebody could be denied because you built a claims adjudicator algorithm. And then goes on to say, I think I would rather that people have their claims paid than denied. So I'll just tune it for two positives. So you note that this interviewee links harms to algorithmic design decisions. So here's a statement exemplifying the recognition of harms to populations in which the interviewee refers to the algorithmic bias study that I just mentioned here, the one that talks about racial biases in health algorithms. and then. Um, down below talks about how the algorithms are used by all health insurers, all big provider groups, and that 
150 million lives go through these algorithms and it underscores African-Americans in a pretty significant way. Several interviewees suggested harms that could actually befall the healthcare systems themselves, such as system disruption or wasted resources, even if machine learning models were accurate. So for example, clinicians could suffer alert fatigue, or if the result was that clinicians don't trust the models, they wouldn't use them and healthcare system resources would be wasted, diverting them from other tools for patient care. Interviewees also described several characteristics of machine learning and the context of its use that could generate or exacerbate the harms that they identified, which we call drivers of harm. Some of these factors that were perceived as generating or exacerbating harms were the inability of users or developers to understand how ML-based tools generate predictions, or perhaps the limited generalizability of models when applying data uh, models to data on new patients. Some of the features were related to the peculiarities of healthcare data, such as sensitivity, its sensitivity, such as, um, uh, uh, as in privacy needs and the complexity of healthcare delivery. And other features were related to differences between the healthcare industry and high tech, which were seen as leading to different perceptions about the responsibilities for addressing risk, as well as generating hype for products that could lead to patient and clinician misunderstanding of AI capabilities. Uh, and so now I'll show you some example, an example or two of, um, just one of these, uh, the potential driver that comes from uh, the intersection of healthcare and high tech industries. So here you can see participants reference to responsibilities for addressing risk, pointing to the disconnect between the tech industry. So here the first quote says, the disconnect that this person sees is in the ethos of how computer science has turned into a business built around the notion of tolerance to failure. The cost of doing it is cheap, so we can fail and move on, do another one. That is antithetical to medicine. You're not allowed to fail with people. The second person talks about the stakes and the stakes being pretty low when Google's imaging detector calls a cat a dog, but then goes on to say, it needs to be tested and tested and tested. I think it's the same kind of thing that needs to happen in healthcare. The only thing is, I don't know what the low stakes thing is in healthcare. So um, after trying to characterize the harms um, perceived by the interviewees, we also examined statements reflecting their perceptions of responsibility for addressing those harms and observed themes of moral engagement, moral disengagement, and conflict. So the interviews statements about moral engagement included those that indicated awareness of moral issues in their work or those that indicated that developers had a role to play in addressing those issues. And these statements have parallels in James Rest's model, um, which posits four requirements for ethical decision-making, which include moral awareness, moral judgment, moral intention, and moral action. We also found statements reflecting what we are calling moral disengagement because we feel these statements have similarities to features of the construct of moral disengagement, which was first described by Albert Ventura, Ventura at Stanford in the 1980s as part of his local, uh, larger social cognitive theory of morality. According to this theory, self-regulation and self-sanctions act to translate moral reasoning into action and moral disengagement was proposed as a psychological mechanism that interferes with this self-regulatory process. So some examples of eight possible cognitive mechanisms that have been identified uh, as part of moral engagement include uh, minimizing or misconstruing consequences of one's behavior, such as uh, minimizing harms. And another type of mechanism involves displacing or diffusing responsibility both of which were types of um, uh, features that we also found. 
So I'll show you a couple of statements of dozens that we categorized as some type of moral disengagement, including the minimizing risks type and the minimizing responsibility types. And then later I'll come back to statements that we categorized as moral engagement. So one way of minimizing risks of machine learning uh, that we found were that uh, interviewees said that they were no different in healthcare than in other contexts. So in this first quote, the interviewee says, it's like your financial is data, financial data is out there too, and someone can way more ruin your life from stealing your identity. Another uh, way in the second quote uh, is to acknowledge that there are hazards of AI, but they aren't relevant to the work that, uh, that the developer does. So here the uh, interviewee talks about the problem of bias and pitfalls and that they might be more pertinent to other types of technologies like device technology. But what this person does is clinical, clinical decision support where uh, they don't really see a huge amount of risk. Other statements indicated a deflection of responsibility for preventing or mitigating harms to others. In the first example here, the locus of responsibility is uh, seen as being with the clinician. The person says the ML tool totally leaves it in the clinician's hands. The clinician understands the context within which the prediction is made uh, and then compares the tool to the dog in the cartoons that points itself in the arrow saying, look this way. In the second statement, the interviewee says they don't have the appropriate expertise and says, I'm not like a health economist type of person. So answer is my work has not tried to optimize for any of that, meaning mitigation of harms. In the third statement, the regulatory system is seen as preventing harms, which allows developers to move forward. And this uh, interview, he talks about federal laws being in place to prevent harms from happening. So we also saw statements reflecting moral awareness and engagement, which indicated that some developers recognize their role in potentially causing harm and that work needs to align with personal values. There were also statements that indication that these uh, machine learning developers also took action. In addition, uh, they described conflicting interests leading to moral dilemmas, as well as perceived barriers to ethical practice. And I'll show you some examples of these. First, um, acknowledgement of uh, harms and responsibility. In the first quote, the interviewee talks about the negative effects of incorrectly identifying a person and says uh, down at the bottom here, we if we falsely flag somebody as having that indication, then the culpability of that duress, you know, at least partly, uh, at least partly does lay on our shoulders. In the second quote, the interviewee says, if I didn't think that they were, meaning the company, were going to also, or the patients were also going to be benefiting these products, then I probably wouldn't be working at the company. Finally, a couple of developers described actions taken. And for example, here, the interviewee talked about helping the predictive modeling team and steering them away from cost-based outcomes. Several interviewees mentioned conflicts that arose because of the business environment in which their products were being developed. For example, one interviewee said that they would like to think that they are helping people, but describe their work as walking a fine line because at the end of the day, they make B2B products, that is business to business products. Another talked about the conflict between using data for improving patient outcomes rather than estimating risk for the business side and not knowing how to put in safeguards against the misuse of data. Yet another interviewee talked about activities that neither they nor the company advocates, but then essentially relinquished agency to the company, saying at the end of the day, a company is going to do what a company is going to do. So here I've got a diagram that shows the elements of uh, moral disengagement. Um, and my screen has just gone blank here. So. Um, I'll just talk about the um, 
putting these things in the model all together, um, which include elements of moral awareness and moral action at the top and facilitators of uh, this awareness and action, as well as moral disengagement, including minimizing risk and minimizing responsibility at the bottom and barriers. All of these were reflected in the comments that we saw uh, from the people that we interviewed, as well as an area of conflict in the middle. So um, it's important to recognize also that the people who made the statements that reflected moral engagement um, indicated at the top of the slide were largely not overlapping with the people who made statements about moral disengagement at the bottom. And we don't really know whether um, there are characteristics of uh, people who that uh, made the statements indicating moral engagement versus disengagement um, that predispose people to being in sort of one class versus the other, um, such as age, race, uh, training, background, um, experiences, um, and so forth. How, uh, partly because we had a small sample size. However, this is a, an issue that we would like to study in the future. We do know that these, um, these non-overlapping sets of people did identify potential facilitators and barriers uh, of um, moral engagement and uh, facilitators of also things that may encourage moral disengagement. Um, and some of the facilitators include education um, and organizational uh, values, as well as uh, regulation to encourage uh, moral action and barriers, uh, including corporate interests uh, and lack of agency and lack of knowledge, which also suggest ways to intervene in this process, um, such that uh, we might try to both um, discourage uh, minimization of risk and minimization of responsibility and encourage moral awareness and moral action. Um, so, there's also areas of conflict in the middle that you can see. And um, I think what was indicated by these areas of conflict was that there's a big role to play or a big influence of the environment in which these more these um, developers are working. So um, there will be challenges to um, both regulators who are depending on uh, the ability of um, machine learning developers and AI scientists to self-regulate given the possible effects of the environment to exacerbate this con these conflicts of interest. Uh, so clearly there's a strong influence of the potential for uh, conflict of interest coming from this work being primarily conducted in the uh, private sector where there are, of course, strong business interests at play. And it's clear that those business interests are felt and trickle down all the way down to the um, level of people who are working deep in data modeling. Uh, and so to the extent that the FDA and, and other regulators are depending on uh, self-regulation and certification and licensure type mechanisms uh, to assure safety and efficacy of these products, um, I believe that our data suggests that there may be challenges to implementing those types of regulatory paradigms. Um, nevertheless, um, I believe that there are ways that we can intervene that are suggested by the data and other literature, um, especially literature on moral disengagement, that simple uh, measures such as even making people aware of the fact that there are um, there are mechanisms of moral disengagement and what those effects are, are actually effective at uh, sort of um, disconnecting the uh, external factors and pressures from the acts of moral disengagement. Um, and so um, we are working right now on such um, interventions uh, and trying to design uh, interventions that can act at the design level um, prior to um, uh, machine, le machine learning developers actually creating their models or perhaps even before they are um, uh, 
at, uh, deciding on what data sources to use uh, in, in their modeling. Um, so uh, we hope that we can use the, um, the findings that we have gotten so far to help us design such interventions to uh, help increase moral engagement and discourage moral disengagement in the population of AI designers. So uh, let's see, I believe that is the last slide. Um, so I will stop sharing and I think we have time for questions. So Mildred, this is Rick. I, um, we're waiting on some questions to come in. So I loved your last slide in terms of uh, facilitators of moral engagement. One of the criticisms I've heard in machine learning is that they can be algorithmically strong, but, but lacking the domain theory contribution, the domain knowledge. And you kind of commented on that in facilitators. Is it, um, and obviously if it's not there, it would serve as a barrier. So is that, has that been your experience that we could do a better job of getting domain theory, domain knowledge into the algorithms? And then secondly, would feedback loops built in do a better job of kind of increasing people's comfort level with the with the decision support system and you can respond to any piece of that you like yeah we did hear um from our interviewees several times many times about this issue of domain knowledge and the value of uh integrating people with deep clinical knowledge mm -hmm. onto their research teams and onto their product development teams. Um, so I think there is recognition, um, growing recognition that this kind of domain knowledge is, is really important um, in design in order to be able to uh, really mitigate some of these harms, biases mm -hmm. in particular, but other types of biases or other types of harms as well, uh, particularly uh, harms that might arise because of how these tools are actually used, how they go, how they are integrated into patient care, how they're integrated into the workflow um, and understanding what the needs of clinicians and what the needs of um, patients are through understanding, um, deep understanding mm -hmm. of how health data are generated or not generated. And also, um, you know, for example, I think, many of these developers were not, since they didn't come from um, healthcare backgrounds, were really um, surprised to find that um, what they typically, you know, use in as uh, a framework for their models is this idea of ground truth, right? The gold standard and what's, what are the actual, uh, what are the, you know, the real data that we're trying to, um, mimic or the real um, associations we're trying to identify with machine learning. And they're surprised that um, a lot of times doctors don't agree, like that pathologists don't agree with uh, diagnosis. So if you put 12, a slide in front of 12 pathologists, you could get 12 different answers. And they just are shocked at the, um, the amount of disagreement there is in medicine about what is a diagnosis and what is a prognosis. and um, I think that's the kind of thing um, that that clinicians can contribute to um, mm -hmm. AI teams is this knowledge that the, the data are really dirty um, and electronic health records are um, notoriously dirty uh, in terms of being really messy. Uh, they don't really reflect reality or the ground truth in the way that um, a naive person might think they do. So as a, as a follow-up to that, have you heard of anything with respect to like any trustworthiness indicators for the algorithms, um, given the dirtiness of them, given the, there can be a good bit 
of confidence in some of the models, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're accurate. And so, um, and you spoke a little bit to that, but um, have you heard any attempt to get some measure of, of um, trustworthiness as a characteristic of the algorithms? Yeah, um, there's a lot of work being done on uh, trustworthiness of AI, but I think there's, it's, there's several components to the trustworthiness. One is the accuracy, of course. Hmm. Um, but another one is also the, um, the issue about performance metrics that I mentioned before. Hmm. So you can have, um, you can have a, a model that has a very high performance as measured by area under the curve, right? High sensitivity and high specificity. But if in the end, you don't really, if a clinician or a patient doesn't really trust uh, the values that underlie that, um, that the, the choice of uh, what those metrics are, then uh, that's another component of trust. So that has to be, you know, that has to be paid attention to. Um, if you, if you, um, if the, the, area under the curve um, doesn't sort of fit with what people's uh, own sort of intuitive sense of what values are implied by the area under the curve, you know, such as, you know, the false negatives and the false positives, what do those mean? Um, then people will sort of intuitively not trust the models themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Um, Andy, I'll, um, I'll kick it to you for your question. Then we've got a number of questions coming in on chat. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Dr. Cho, for this talk. Uh, it's uh, really, really fascinating stuff. And I'm really happy that people are thinking about the ethics of this kind of thing. Um, my question is sort of related to Dr. Inbox um, having to do with trusting these models or trusting the outputs of these models. Uh, I've been obsessed with chat GPT, just seeing what it's capable of. And one of the things I've, I, I tried to use it as a research tool once just to see, would it give me an accurate list of readings in my field? Like if I wanted to like read up on a subject. So I use my own field as a test and it just straight made up stuff. <clears throat> like it made up articles that didn't exist, gave me a long, long list. And it all sounded really good, right? It, you know, the, the journal title sounded good. So <clears throat> This question's about getting things wrong. One is um, there's there's ways in which these machines could get things wrong just by like making stuff up. And, and maybe we could fact check that by having sort of audits of the outputs. But there's another kind of way that I'm curious what your thoughts are. And this has to do with bias as well, where it um, one of the interesting things um, about uh, AI is it'll recognize patterns that humans are completely incapable of recognizing, right? Or it'll, it'll put things together and, and then draw interesting inferences that we're just cognitively incapable of doing. And I'm wondering, is it likely that bias could get baked in somewhere else where it's recognizing patterns between things and we don't even realize that what it's doing is based on some bad stereotypes or anything like that? And is there are people talking about that? And is there anything that we could possibly hope to do to prevent or mitigate that? Those sort of super behind the scenes inferences where bias might be worked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a lot of work being done um, on that on that issue. Um, and so one example of that is, uh, for example, in uh, radiology, um, there's been uh, some models that were found to I, uh, give spurious reading, you know, output because what it was actually identifying was the color of paint in the room that was in the photographs behind uh, patients or the type of machine that is being used um, to make uh, like a CT scanner or something like that that gives out a certain type of, that has a certain pattern to it in the data that has nothing to do with, um, you know, the patient or, or anything like that. But what the machine learning is picking up on, on is patterns that are there, but they are completely irrelevant. So just spurious 
results and and they're very hard to detect um so that of course as you as you pointed out does create um you know the possibility for creating distrust among clinicians because the findings just aren't they just don't seem right right and so um uh i think part of obviously you want to correct the errors in that by by doing some sort of evaluation um which you know as i was mentioning there there's very little of, there's very little of this type of systematic evaluation um, of the accuracy. But even if you do have accurate findings, um, there's also an, another step, which is sort of convincing clinicians to sort of come along with you and accept the findings. And when they are not intuitive, obviously that's that's a challenge. Um, and, and part of the um, hurdle is to, um, have an explanation and have a transparency about why the um, the model is giving you the results that it is. Um, and so obviously if it's a spurious finding because of a um, you know a artifact in in certain machines, then um, that's something that doesn't deserve to be trusted. but if it's uh, because it's just something that the um, the AI was able to detect because it's a pattern that humans wouldn't be able to detect because we haven't looked at as, uh, as much data, then, um, uh, you know, there needs to be some way to convey that, that level of information um, in the spirit of being transparent um, to clinicians to help them sort of uh, reconcile their own intuitions with uh, the data from the AI. Thank you. And the, we've got a number of questions. We'll try to get through most of these here, but um, one of the first questions that came in along these lines of uh, trustworthiness, do you think that machine learning engineers involved in medical-based AI um, should go through some kind of medical board certification or some kind of medical-based training um, in order to maybe appreciate better the, um, <clears throat> the implications of the work? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that would certainly help. Um, there isn't a sort of formal mechanism to require that right now. Uh, there isn't even a mechanism to assure that um, that AI developers have training in AI. <laughs> so, um, but certainly, I think that's some it somewhat. Uh, in the direction that the FDA is thinking about um, in terms of certifying processes rather than products. So part of a process certification could be assurance of some type of training or inclusion of people with clinical experience um, on, on teams, um, if not uh, training of the people who are developing the software directly. Another question, uh, machine learning is based on the data that we give it. I feel that most of the weaknesses such as racial disparities come straight from the data that we provide. Could, the, could we wait somehow or discount the algorithms to remove some of these racial biases? Yeah, there's, there's a number of, there's a lot of work being done on this, um, type of bias that's introduced by the training data. Um, so I think there's there's bias that's introduced uh, through the data, but there's also biases that are introduced through the modeling. And I think I gave you some examples of the latter, um, but clearly both are important. Um, the, there's, um, I think the direction that this work is going in um, is, is useful in that it's looking at um, it, it's it's drawing more attention for AI developers to really question what variables they're using in their models and whether these variables are really um, are they proxy variables or are they the real variables that you're trying to get at because using proxies um, tends to um, be a sort a potential uh, place that bias can be introduced. Um, and also that uh, there are, it, it, it is um, sort of shining light on the importance of really trying to 
be clear about what types of um, how you're defining uh, how you're defining different variables. So, for example, um, how are you defining and how you're defining things like bias, right? So, uh, there's just different ways that you can define uh, bias that can be um, that can lead to uh, more or less effective ways of mitigating the bias. Um, so for example, you can uh, think about bias as, um, it's like the difference between equity and equality, right? So are, are you trying to um, make the false positives and false negatives the same for all populations, but maybe that's not fair, right? Um, just trying to maximize for um, sensitivity or specificity. And so really questioning what what is not only kind of high performance, but what is fair performance um, is another way of putting that. And a little bit along those lines, what are your thoughts on explainability versus performance of the machine learning tools? Well, I think um, some uh, data scientists sort of think about um, performance and explainability as having trade-offs. So the more explainable, the less performance and vice versa. But um, others are also looking at how um, those two features can be sort of disconnected so that you don't necessarily have to have one without the other um, and are um, trying to increase the explainability of it. Uh, uh, of AI um, by building that into models. So uh, being able to identify which variables are uh, the drivers of the output in the models. Uh, uh, and I think that'll go a long way towards increasing the trustworthiness of it. Um, another question, I was wondering what systems processes, perhaps beyond individual companies, are the most critical in addressing these problems? what systems or processes? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. And I think this is the one that the FDA is wrestling with right now. Um, you know, I think some of these, I think that there's also, there's some activity that um, is directed towards uh, defining um, certain types of minimum standards for uh, whether for, um, if not minimum standards, at least sort of guidelines for um, trying to uh, outline practices, sort of best practices that will um, enhance all of these different features that we've been talking about. So best practices for transparency of models, best practices for um, data, uh, you know, being transparent about what data are your, what data are you using to train the models? Um, probably best practices for data sharing would be very useful because right now that is a huge um, barrier that our, interviewees talked a lot about is um, that much of this data comes uh, is derived in the private sector and not a lot of it is shared um, that you know it obviously exacerbates bias and is um, a hindrance to different health systems being able to test you know understand the generalizability of models and being able to test before they're implemented being able to test our models on different populations um, so you can understand um, how much of the model output is being driven by you know, quirks in patient populations versus how generalizable they are. So um, I think these are sort of systems levels issues that need to be addressed, um, uh, in particular access to uh, data that will decrease biases. 
I think we might have time for two questions here. It sounds like the study somewhat addressed this, but what responsibility do the respondents or you or the field put um, on frontline clinicians to be aware of the limitations and biases in AI predictive analytics and potentially act differently when biases exist? Mm. Yes, this is, a, this is a tough one because um, in some ways I think I wish we didn't have to do this because that puts responsibility on the clinicians for the performance of a tool that they're supposed to be able to use with assurances of safety and efficacy sort of built into it. Um, so I hate to sort of put the onus on the clinician. Um, it would be like saying, you know, you need to like counteract the, uh, or somehow, um, somehow, you know, uh, uh, account for deficiencies in um, the accuracy of a genetic test, for example. Um, that said, um, you know, none of the products that we use are perfect um, and they do have side effects, drugs have side effects and um, uh, tests don't, are never 100% sensitive and specific. So, um, I think the same types of caveats that we apply to any type of any type of medical tool or product um, apply here. Um, it's just that there's a lot less information. Like we typically get a label on a drug, so we know what the what the downsides are to using the drug or who we should not use um, certain drugs for, um, what the side effects are to look for, and what to tell the patient. So um, I think um, if there's if there's anything that regulatory bodies could do to help this situation, it would be to have the equivalent of labeling on their products that is required so that the limitations of these um, are much more transparent to, to clinicians. I think this question is also kind of good or good from a broad sense here. Um, in terms of the certified programs to better understand healthcare AI, what are your thoughts on increasing or proposing new educational programs at colleges that combine IT and healthcare like health information technology, HIT, health informatics, um, et cetera, to train future professionals at an earlier, earlier age in both fields are, are really, uh, especially in IT fields? Yeah, I think that's a great question because many of the people that we talk to in our interviews are, I think, fairly typical in that they've done a lot of their um, data science and, and software engineering work in other fields other than healthcare, and they didn't themselves have training in healthcare. So um, they tend to naturally take their experiences in working in financial systems or in other industries and just apply that to medicine without having you know, the awareness and knowledge that um, the, the, what their current, whatever their practices were that they um, learned in other contexts don't necessarily apply um, in the healthcare context. So um, one thing that data scientists that I have run into and students um, that I interact with have told me that they found very valuable would be simply to be able to um, basically go into hospital settings, see real patients, see what daily practice is like for clinicians, see an actual uh, electronic health record being made, like what it, what it looks like to fill in an electronic health record by a clinician that has six minutes to see their patient, right? <laughs> and, um, right, they don't really, they don't have that opportunity. They don't know what real healthcare looks like. They don't know what it looks like in a rural health clinic. They don't know what it looks like in a busy, you know, um, quaternary care hospital. They, um, these are valuable experiences to actually see what, how products, their products would be used in real life and how the data are generated. So that's pretty simple. Um, I think just seeing, you know, I, I see this also with other types of biomedical researchers. I, I can't tell you how many genetic researchers I've talked to who said, I've never actually seen a patient with this condition that I'm studying. I, I think that is just um, a simple way of um, encouraging people to really um, have deeper understanding of uh, of 
the 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 context in which they're working and how um, they may have some preconceived notions that are uh, that need to be dispelled. Yeah, it's uh, we need to conclude, but um, as someone put in the chat that you know years ago, I think when a lot of us were going through our PhD programs, there were other curricular requirements such as taking philosophy and morality courses that you know, some of the soft science areas, um, and I've got a number of philosophers on this call, um, that they would, you know, really encourage having that kind of moral um, discussion about, you know, the impact of, of some of these data sets uh, maybe having on decision-making, clinical decision-making. So um, we will conclude it there, but thank you so much, Dr. Cho, for being with us today. And I'm sorry about all the hardships you're encountering on your end. And thank goodness for the generator um, that got through <laughs> our call today. Um, thanks everyone for being on the call. You'll receive a follow-up email from me um, to complete the evaluation. So thanks everybody. For those on the call, we can give a, a clap. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Thank you. Cho, so much. Thank you.